Um, so today in Behavioral Conversations, we have uh, Dr. Jennifer Perusini with us. She's the CEO of uh, Neurovation Lab. We are so excited to have you, Jennifer. Thank you so much for finding out the time uh, to speak with us. Uh, so quickly, can you introduce yourself to our audiences and also talk a little, a little about your work? Sure. Yeah, my name is Jennifer Perazzini. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Neurovation Labs. Uh, we're a New York-based biotech startup, and we're currently developing the first objective diagnostic and companion targeted treatment for post-traumatic stress disorder or PTSD. Wow, this is, this is such an inspiring work. I mean, the first time I got through your profile, I was like, wow, can someone even think of doing something like this? Because, you know, it, it you, usually it just gets in the conversation PTSD, but nobody really thinks of curing it or developing a diagnosis for it. So uh, I'll quickly start with the question. So from your background, Jennifer, you have studied in prestigious institutes like Barnard College at Columbia University, and then you went on to pursue your doctoral studies at UCLA. So what was the journey like? Can you share your experience with us? Yeah, well, my major in college was neuroscience and behavior. Um, Barnard College is the all-women's college of Columbia University, and I loved every second of it. I felt like it was the ideal place to figure out what I wanted to do with the best support mm -hmm. system around. Um, right after graduation, I made the trek out west to UCLA, where I did my doctorate in behavioral neuroscience. So that was interdisciplinary um, within the neuroscience and psychology departments. And in graduate school, um, I had this preclinical rodent model of PTSD, and that's where I really got into like, the nitty gritty of studying the brain and how um, fear memories are held there, basically. Um, it really was more of a straight path forward, and I didn't take any time off between undergrad and grad school. Um, it was really after I got my PhD that I started taking more of an alternative path. Um, I still did a short postdoctoral fellowship at Columbia University back in New York, um, but I was constantly thinking of ways I could turn my research into something really meaningful outside of academia. So how, how was the transition like from academics to industry? Yeah, I mean, well, I always saw myself in industry, I never really saw myself as um, a professor uh, with a university lab. Um, in my mind, I thought I could accomplish so much more um, without administrative control of a university. I now know that to not be true, it's not necessarily faster and um, startups do face unique challenges. Um, but I really wasn't truly happy in um, my postdoctoral fellowship and after having a conversation with my PhD advisor who gave me his blessing to start a business, uh, it was really an easy decision. So what, have you faced any challenges like uh, compared to industry and academia in research? I mean, particularly in PTSD? Um, yeah, so between academia and industry, you know, Neurovation is still very much a research lab. Um, it's not really much different than how it was in academia, except that I actually do not personally conduct the research anymore. Um, our labs are spread across the country and internationally, um, but our behavior, really that the crux of the background of our work um, has been replicated um, countless times. And it's really this simple but robust model of PTSD. Um, we're not yet in human trials and there's always that, that big question of whether the in vitro work and the in vivo animal work will translate. But our biomarker is highly conserved across species and we do have confidence that um, it will translate well uh, to, to humans, yeah. I mean, hopefully, because this is like the need of the hour. I know. And we have been fascinated by your research, uh, you know, surrounding post-trauma uh, stress disorder. Could you tell us more about uh, where do you see this research uh, in the next decade? Yeah, so, well, PTSD, for those who don't know, is a debilitating mental health condition with symptoms like flashbacks and hyperreactivity, and it can affect anyone who has experienced a trauma that's combat, accidents, abuse, etc. Um, in the next decade, especially after the pandemic and what the whole globe went through, um, I see many people, many researchers flooding to this area to do work. Um, I do, unfortunately, see more exploration 
exploration of illicit drugs. Those flashy headlines are really kind of unavoidable, but I also see work continuing to understand the, the mechanisms um, underlying the disorder and the genetic components underlying the disorder. So that could be really, really exciting. Wow, that, that is that is really, I mean, it's very amusing at the same time, it's very intriguing as well. Like, so since you've been in the industry for quite some time now, since you started this company, uh, what sort of scientific consensus have you experienced around your research? Yeah, well, there's there's much scientific consensus. Um, the PTSD model that we use, um, it's called Stress Enhanced Fear Learning or CEPHAL, um, is really the gold standard in preclinical PTSD research now. Um, it uses both Pavlovian and non-associative learning procedures um, to produce extreme fear responses to mild stimuli after a traumatic event. So it's likened to, say, a combat soldier returning home and experiencing a heightened response yeah. to minor cues. Um, and so Dr. Michael Fanslow, who was my um, PhD advisor, and he's a distinguished professor and learning and behavior department chair at UCLA, um, is a world recognized authority on the neurobiology underlying fear, anxiety, and stress related mm -hmm. behavior. So it's, it's um, our research is very well received in, in, the, in the field. Wow, so that, that that is also amazing to hear that it's very, you know, it's accepted and also appreciated at the same time. So this is what you've been uh, talking about is like purely scientific inquiry, but at Neurovation, so your company, like you aim to take it to the market as well. So what will be the challenges involved in moving from a scientific inquiry to the market and its commercialization? Yeah, I mean, there are challenges we face every day and some that we haven't even experienced yet. Um, the first thing is that we must continue progress with our research and development of our two products. Um, once we get to a good stage, we'll then have to line up clinical trials and work with the FDA here in America um, in order to get our diagnostic and treatment approved and ready for the market. Um, but the main challenge really for any startup um, at any stage is consistent flow of money. Without funding, we can't progress. So that's, that's really number Absolutely. one. That's the biggest challenge always. So uh, have you been facing any challenges in terms of funding as well? In terms of finding funding? Yeah. So right now we're actually um, fortunately funded by the Department of Defense. Um, we have mm -hmm. a few contracts with the, uh, the U.S. Air Force, which has been really, really amazing um, working with them. Um, once we get to um, more advanced stages, we will be looking for more investor-related invest, you know, funding mechanisms, um, but we're, we're not quite there yet. Oh, that, that is also amazing. Like each, everything that you're telling me more about the book, it's like I'm so fascinated by it. So another curious question that I have is, uh, what would you change as a doctoral student knowing that you would want to work uh, on your startup? Uh, you know, I don't know if I would have actually changed anything because I always felt I'd wind up in industry. Um, I think in general, really, <laughs> the advice I always give to any doctoral student is, I really feel like I sort of rushed through. Um, I finished very young. I was only 25, but I felt like I was ready for retirement. <laughs> I was so old at that point. Um, but I, I feel like I, I felt like I needed to finish in, in record time. Um, so I think if I went back, I would have taken time to flesh out some other ideas before I left and maybe publish a few more, more papers and not just have it be such a, a rush. Oh, okay. Awesome. So since you are the CEO of the company, so everybody has like the started star studded impression of a startup. Like, I mean, even in academia, someone will be like, oh, she's running her own company. Like, that must be amazing. Can anything be better than that? So, but behind the scenes, what challenges do you face? Yeah, well, I do wear many hot hats. Um, I went from pure neuroscience research um, to doing everything. So I still analyze the data in um, our labs, but I don't actually do the research, as I said. Um, 
And, you know, I'm based in New York, but we have labs spread across the entire country and internationally, um, which is great for quality control and quality assurance. Um, you know, I'm also constantly speaking at conferences, taking investor calls, um, attending meetings, writing emails, um, and fundraising all the time. You're never not fundraising. Um, you know, so it's, it's very busy. I think the challenge is just being very busy and very exhausted. Um, it's it's daunting that I wear so many hats because something could fail at any second and it's my responsibility. And again, the main challenge, as I've already mentioned, is funding and fundraising. Um, yeah. You know, I have to not just be able to pay for my um, my science and my R&D, but I have to be able to pay myself and others on the team. Um, and so that's just a thought that's always looming um, every day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So like, what are the good things and bad things associated with running a company, which is also conducting a novel research? So would you change anything if you were to do it again? Well, there are a lot of good things about running a startup, at least for me um, and my personality. I really do uh, like being the boss. Uh, I like having control over my own schedule. And it's a really cool experience to not have um any boundaries. So if I wanted to explore a new research avenue, I can as long as there's funding for it. Um, I also enjoy working in every aspect. I know it is exhausting, but I've learned so many new skill sets that I don't think I would have necessarily learned if I continued to just work in a lab. Um, in terms of the bad though, it is incredibly cutthroat to be in business. Um, you have to be able to um, be willing to really pivot and be flexible. And the biotech world changes just all the time uh, with what's hot and what's not. So in the very beginning, when I started my company, it was right around the same time that a very infamous diagnostic company went under. Um, so no one was interested in my diagnostic product. But now in the post-COVID world, everybody wants an objective diagnosis for every disorder. Um, another thing that's bad is that you really do have to have tough skin. Um, I have hundreds of meetings throughout the years with investors and you hear no a lot and there's no sugarcoating and just people, people tell you how it is. Um, so I've learned to take criticism in stride. So I wouldn't say it's bad. It's something that I really had to learn though. Um, and yeah, everything's just a learning experience, even if the feedback isn't given in the most positive way. But um, if I had to go back and change anything, I think I would, again, not try to be so hasty. I was hasty trying to finish my, my PhD and I was hasty trying to learn about business. And I brought a lot of people into my circle um, to help me manage the company and, and to learn from. And um, I think I should have been a little bit more picky about the advice that I was um, taking in the very beginning. It worked out well, but um, I really had a lot to learn. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, learning is a lifelong process. And even after you become a theory, you still have a lot to learn, which is absolutely clear, even from your experience. Um, Jennifer, you mentioned about, uh, you know, the, the rise in people wanting to be, uh, you know, the diagnosis for disorders. So can, do you think that uh, the research that you are doing can also be applicable to other disorders which are, sen I mean, related to central nervous systems, like Alzheimer's or Parkinson's or something like that? That's a really great question. Um, our most recent Air Force contract is actually to do exploratory research um, to test our diagnostic in um, micro traumatic brain injuries um, mm -hmm. or TBIs, which is really exciting. Um, our biomarker is important for cell firing and cell communication all over the brain. And so with PTSD, we're just looking in a very specific area, um, the fear center of the brain, the amygdala. So. Um, this, this protein is really implicated in a lot of different disorders in varying capacities and in different regions. So I really do think that we can apply our knowledge to other disorders. Wow, that's that's like, yeah, one thing can lead to another and we can actually discover something which is, you know, gonna help the society really. Um, so one more curious question that I have is that, uh, what was going on in your head uh, when you were moving out of your PhD program uh, versus when you got into the PhD program? Like what things you had in mind and both, you know, both, uh, both ends. Wow. Uh, it was so long ago. <laughs> I defended my thesis over eight years ago. Um, 
I think when I started my PhD program, I felt like it was just more school. Um, I didn't take any time off from undergrad. So, and I was young, I was only 21. So I was excited to also have moved across the country and try something new. So it was just, it was more school, but in a, a new exciting environment. Um, but by the end, I really felt like I had accomplished so much and I had such a large body of research um, I was really proud of. And I really start, started to see the path to my career forming. <laughs> awesome. So considering uh, the time that we have now, I'll quickly go with my last question that I have for you. Uh, so from your experience and your, you know, from academia and as well as from uh, your uh, the industry that you're working in, what do you think is the most promising uh, research venue that connects like, let's say, behavioral science with neuroscience, especially uh, in the light of the landmark work that you're doing in physiology? Like, whatever comes to your mind, like, ca that can be a research venue that connects, like, which is also interdisciplinary. Yeah, well, I do hope that biomarker discovery continues and paves the way um, for new treatments and diagnostics for mental health disorders. Um, right now, all we have to measure um, those types of disorders is behavior, but um, we really do, uh, at least with my company, view mental health disorders as physical disorders with physical underpinnings. And we believe that the method of diagnosis and treatment should really reflect that. Um, and traditionally, healthcare has really viewed our brains as black boxes, um, but biomarkers do exist for psychiatric diseases. Many just have yet to be discovered, and I really hope um, that we continue down that road. Yeah. I think yeah, this, if we connect uh, disciplines and not leave them in silos, it's going to help, uh, you know, we, we're going to have research that can have such in, some impact in the society and just breaking barriers between disciplines like let's say neuroscience, psychology, or even behavioral science, I would say. Absolutely. Um, I, I know I said that uh, in, the, in the last question that this will be my last, but I have like one more question out of my curiosity yeah. for you, like, um, I've been um, see, uh, looking after your work for quite some time through Twitter and through our engagements as well. So I know that you've been working a lot for women representation in science. Uh, so do you have like some advice for women who are, I mean, who are first gen PhD scholars or who have some like really uh, nice ideas about starting something, but then they are not too confident about it? So do you have like some suggestions like how to go about it? Yeah, you know, I think there's a, there's a lot of advice that I can give. I think just in general for women in science, um, always take the plunge if you feel in your heart that something's right um, and you're motivated to continue working. Don't let anything stop you. Don't let bad advice stop you or bad feedback. Just keep going. I think that's the most important thing. Um, like I said, I had to grow tough skin um, with business, but I think women in science just in general have to grow tough skin and um, uh, just keep going. That's number one. Um, in terms of starting a business, um, I always give the advice that, you know, not every idea belongs as, you know, in, in business and not everybody is suited to start a business and that's okay. Everybody can support and the ecosystem in some way. We have lawyers, business people, financial people, scientists that all work toward a common goal of getting products novel products to market. Um, I think that if you do think you have novel ideas, start to talk to people in the industry, um, start to speak with patent lawyers so you can protect your intellectual property. That's very, very important. Um, and just start to seek advice from anyone you can in the field to see where you can fit into that ecosystem. Um, that was an amazing answer. <laughs> You know, uh, now I'll have to cut it short. And it was really lovely uh, to speak with you, Jennifer. And we hope to see the advancement in PTSD research through Neurovations Lab and always like, you know, keep inspiring people. You are my mentor. And <laughs> I'm always going to be inspired from you. And like me, I think thousands other women as well in science. Oh, thank you so much for having me. <laughs> thank you.